Well, schools are such a central and important institution in our society. It is mandatory that all citizens go to school from the age of, you know, kindergarten to 16. And so it is the institution that provides a history of the country and a place that had a profound influence on how our society sees itself, what it values, and what it promotes. Schools are identity-shaping institutions. Maybe the most powerful or one of the most powerful identity-shaping institutions. We have kids that spend somewhere around 13,000 hours in public school, and they are, they are shaped by that process. They are, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> I do this in class, right? This is 13,000 hours. It's quite mind-blowing that we send our children to school to not be proud of who they are, to conform into this idea of competition. I think the form of education is a type of like entrapment of um, persisting and, and upholding the, the colonial rule. That's what I think education does. Western science and indigenous ways of knowing are two separate knowledge systems. Schooling was really all about developing the mind, but for us, it's about developing the four dimensions, mental or emotional or physical or spiritual aspects of who we are, which is a little bit more complex. You're here now, and this is where our education started. It's from the land. It's what you see. The buffalo has always been our main source of education. Taught us about perseverance, eh? Taught us about survival and the land, the land. That's why we, we always say we respect the land. We're going towards the, where the buffalo jumped is still is and was years ago you can see the land how it is it cuts where the buffalo used to run you can actually see and then there's a, a steep drop right down there i've had students here come here and uh, troubled students that really didn't have a good life, happy life. There's teepees over here. We go over there and, and we cook and we eat. Sometimes it takes a couple of days and then the laughter comes. They're not angry anymore. They're, they're happy. There's that sense of freedom. Even for that little while. Yeah, that's how I've seen the students change when you bring them here. Because it's different here. It's natural, and I've seen many changes happen. Not everybody understands the value of bringing people together who, some still trying to find that place of identity for themselves that is so important. I've realized something in this journey that I'm currently on. My Bachelor of Education degree, my Master's degree, None of that has prepared me to walk into the spaces that I need to walk in and be that strong voice. The teachings of my elders, knowing who I am, that strong sense of cultural identity, that's what allows me to go into those spaces. If we don't nurture that cultural identity in our students, it doesn't matter how much of that formal education we give them.
Education is reluctant to teach about racism against Indigenous people and Indigenous rights and sovereignty. Instead, education has remained silent and it works to erase, deny, and minimize colonialist practices both past and present. The current state of education isn't a safe place. It isn't a nice place for teachers too, not just students. I want to let my students know who they are and where they come from and what is their purpose. That learning is just maybe a little bit different, but I'm going to try my very best and paralleling Indigenous thought and ways of knowing and being into my classroom. Understanding not only the culture but the the social and the political and the historical kind of realities that are in our communities and sharing those with uh, students is really important so they have a, a good understanding of who they are and, and, and where they come from. Everybody's equal in Canada. Canada does not have a race problem. And education is the great equalizer. These are three really powerful discourses. And it's all lies. I mean, it's identifiably untrue, both historically and in the present. That belief that education is, a, is an equalizer, I think can also encourage blaming the victim because it also makes an assumption that education is neutral, that we just pass through this neutral institution. In that way, then, it enables blaming the victim. If you did not make it through, then, you didn't try hard enough. So, oh, you're gonna get an education, you're gonna feel good, you're gonna learn all these lessons, you're gonna have great teachers who are open-minded, you're gonna feel safe. That's not 100% true, especially if you look like me. So you've had a week at home, yeah, and that was good? Yeah. How do you feel about going back? I'm not excited. You're not excited? No. What changed? I don't know. When you heard your parents talking about being scared and stuff, did you, do, do you ever feel that way? Yeah. Because, like, um, sometimes I, I think that, like, gonna be me next that ends up in the river. Really? Why do you think you might be next? Because I'm native. So you just don't feel safe? No. no. There's some people that don't like us. Although maybe it has gotten somewhat better since the time that I went to the K-12 system, it's only minimally so. We continue to have spaces, I think, in our classrooms where our Indigenous students, our Métis and our First Nation students, 
don't feel their voice is valid. They don't see their culture, their languages represented in what they're learning. The day-to-day -day kind of things you run into, the racism, the subtle aspects of racism. It puts us that constant struggle and that constant challenge to fit in into Canadian society, and yet this is our homeland. Saskatchewan farmer Gerald Stanley was acquitted of shooting and killing Colton Bushy. An inconsistency that struck out for me was just how prominently dominant histories of settlement and development figured at the expense of Indigenous ones. So in the trial itself, the sort of story of the virtuous, hardworking farmer who did the most reasonable thing he could do when his, his supposed castle was threatened really replicates the sort of the origins and trajectory of settler colonialism in Canada. The ideas that really drove initial settlement to Canada, the idea that the farmer or the European settler could come here and cultivate his castle, um, cultivate this life for himself. Um, and we saw that very same story uh, employed by Stanley's defense. Um, so they, they drew directly from this narrative uh, in talking about how that sort of vision of a good life that's driven by the drive to you know accumulate capital, which in turn is only made possible by the dispossession of indigenous people, that justified Stanley's actions that day uh, in the encounter with the indigenous youth who drove onto his farm. There are many kinds of racism in Canada. So it has a public face when we can see it, we can name it, we can confront it, but it kind of has a, a private face in that it exists in systems and people aren't even aware that it's there. The media perpetuates liberal narratives citing racial tensions rather than naming white supremacy, which has long been enforced by all systems of colonial institutions. Through the media, through the health services, through justice, through education, through social work, the high level of apprehension of Indigenous children the high incarceration rate. Almost on a daily basis, we see evidence of the racial inequality that detrimentally impacts the social, political, and economic well-being of Indigenous people. So that everyone is equal in Canada is like a very effective myth to hide the inequality that exists.
what's the first thing that new immigrants to Saskatchewan learn? Like, how long does it take them to learn the, the racism that we have towards Indigenous people? What's the study? Three weeks? I mean, often it's, it's the cab ride from the airport, right, where they're told, don't put your kids in school here, <laughs> right? This is the kind of neighborhood you want to avoid. These are the places of the city to avoid, and here's, here's why. Right? There's no class that, I mean, this is the air that we breathe, right? right? We'd like to think that, that those race problems are kind of in the past. And then we're shocked as we realize, as we tease that forward to the present, those implicit ways that race continues to play a role. And I, but, I mean, that's, that's our history. It's not an aberration. It's, in fact, how our nation is built, the language that our nation is built on. The root of the problem is whiteness. Canada has avoided very well understanding these inequities as an effect of racialization. I think it's partly because they don't really want to look and accept the past. They can't believe that they're associated with like early settlers. Canada has admitted its sin. It's really important for the people to address that sin too as well. If they were to address this idea of racism, Indigenous peoples, I, for example, I'm willing and wanting to move forward. So forgiveness, as I've been taught, is the only way to move forward. And let's see where we can go from there. I think like taking responsibility, you know, like going beyond I'm sorry, owning that history, and be willing to make changes within their institutions, within how we educate, Truth and Reconciliation is asking Canadian people to look at their history, to look at the history of residential schools. What is the ideology? What is the policy? And what is the thinking that made it okay to terrorize our people? I'm thinking back to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I'm thinking about Justice Murray Sinclair's words. It's not important that you think that reconciliation will happen. It's important that you think that it should happen. The starting place, I think, is what's a change of heart? And I think that starting place, that changes everything. When I talked to teachers, they said, you're still teaching our Canadian history from the perspective of Europeans, whether you know it or not. You can tell your students who those first Europeans were who came to this land by name but you cannot name the people they met. If we can find out what the people of the Bronze Age from thousands of years ago were thinking when they were inventing the tools at that time, why the hell can't we find out what people only 500 years ago were finding? talk about treaty and treaty relationships. It's not in that limited sense only about dates and names and uh, reading scripts. It's deeply about, I think, the future. My hope when I think about education writ large is that we would deeply enable our students to think of themselves meaningfully as treaty people, that they would see education as a, a means to begin to restore the relationship. The mandatory Treaty education is important, and I understand 
that teachers have ongoing need for support. That boy win. Until the 1960s, school materials, whether in teacher training or elementary and high school, they were not self-conscious or embarrassed about naming Anglo-Saxon white superiority as the goal of education. Part of the way we challenge that is to perhaps expose its, its, its commitments to, if you look at the documents, white superiority. Yeah. Saskatchewan people. The Saskatchewan Department of Cultural Meaning, 1978. Um, just looking at the different sections. Oh my God. The first subheading is before history. In other words, when the colonizers arrived. Forward and acknowledgement. And I have a picture of someone who is from the Ku Klux Klan. And I wonder why would I be wanting to acknowledge that? Tribes gone. They're just gone. What's the purpose of these cartoons? I mean, I look at the, the images and the headings, and it reminds me of other things I've seen like this. Things that have contributed to <laughs> bulletin board displays in schools because people thought that this was okay. So when I look at this and the very fact that it says vanishing Métis makes people think that we don't exist anymore, that we existed in history. Even the way that they talk about non-native people, I think um, there's something to be said about that. This only creates self-hatred. Who would want to be an Indian after reading this book? Again, this is another continuation, fabrication of the untruths being still told in school. And if I had a garbage can beside me, this is where it would go. When you create something like this and it lives in libraries and it lives in society and it lives for children and youth and adults to review and to learn from, if this is what exists, it's no wonder that we have the issues we have. Are we doing a good job promoting diversity, but in a respectful, appropriate, kind way? I think it's important that we stress that we need more Indigenous teachers in schools. Systemically, we need to address that partly by um, absolutely massively increasing the numbers of Indigenous teachers, administrators, directors, like, I mean, I think at, at all levels, uh, we need much more. multiculturalism, I think that's just a cop-out for not addressing the real problem, for not addressing the real issues in regards to Indigenous identity. This is our land. This is our home. Multiculturalism is limited in that it's about the other. We also need to look at how dominance is set up and reinforced and who gets to appreciate another culture. And so what is the dominant norm? that we're judging some cultures as different and others as just every day.
Today, it's so important to provide space for young people to be able to express themselves in multiple ways. For me, it's that constant, constant reflecting back. You know, what was it about being out on the trap line that makes me who I am as an Aboriginal person? What I see happening at one of the schools here in Saskatoon, there's a Métis cultural program there, the first ever. It never existed. And so that's a hopeful place for me. I see education looking there like it looks in our communities. We have young people, our students, learning from a youth, learning from a teacher, learning from an elder or a traditional knowledge keeper, and it's a family. More and more schools have started adopting land-based education, particularly schools with high Indigenous populations. Students are getting out of the classroom and learning lessons from and on the land, often from Indigenous elders and knowledge keepers. It's really about developing whole human beings. And you see them become comfortable with the teachers and, and, and those of us involved with them. And, and there's a removal of that sort of dominance and an obedience model within the school. You begin to see you have real relationships with the kids. And that creation of a space where it truly reflects natural learning. The learning happens through the lens of Métis history. They are engaged and they are learning and they are confident. As we go forward into the future, I think people will come to know who we are. People will know uh, how we think and why we think the way that we do. It's about finding our voice, really, and sharing those perspectives that are really important. I think art is really powerful and it has a voice for the silent and is able to not only interrupt but also leave the door open for good conversation. in our classroom we talk about issues of racism and oppression you know colonization how we begin to decolonize and what we try to do in our classroom is just try to interrupt it and saying you have the four walls but can those four walls be taken down you know can we begin to connect to our communities and if it's reconciliation work it's not just textbook work like reconciliation it should be an action one of the big themes in her art is land and use of it and how what we do impacts the future. I think that's important here because we are on Treaty 6 territory and the people of Saskatoon, after seeing this exhibition, can ask themselves, what are we doing here? Who is it affecting? And how can we change it? To like show people there's indigenous women that are still missing and are being murdered. There's still racism going on towards First Nations. It's all still there. Aside from content, the, the big change that I see happening, certainly on, on our campus and, and in our program, is the relationships. There are so many opportunities on campus to engage with indigenous peoples. And it's not normal, but it's becoming more normal. And so we'll see if our schools and our educational leaders have the courage and the moral bearing to look at what their history has produced. You have to name the problem, accept the problem, accept that we have this problem before you can find your way out. Life is a lot faster than when I was a child. Today, uh, our youth struggle because sometimes they don't have the time. They feel they don't have the time. We should honor the young people 
We need to embrace them and honor them. They need to have a voice.